The step that follows a lithography step is an etching step. We use lithography to define which areas of a film we want to keep, and then an etching step comes and removes all the areas that regions that we don't want to keep, right? So again, going through this process, now we're going to talk about material removal, where we go and remove the extra material that uh, is not needed from a particular film or sometimes a substrate. Bulk micromachining is referring to a situation where we remove the material from the substrate in order to define our structures, right? So we go, let's say, uh, start with the silicon wafer, we remove material from silicon wafer and define the structure from within the substrate. It's carving out a structure out of a substrate. Surface micromachining, on the other hand, it refers to a situation where we go and deposit layers, structural layers, on the surface of the material substrate and pattern those layers and create the device above the surface of my substrate. So in this situation, I usually just use the substrate as a mechanical, uh, let's say, anchor point or sometimes as an electrical ground plane but it really does not play a major role in the, fab, in the mechanics of my device. Surface micromachining is obviously more flexible in terms of the choice of materials that you have. However, the limitation is on the, order, uh, on the thickness of the layers. You cannot really have very thick layers in surface micromachining. Now, once you're putting these layers on top of each other and you want to partly remove this one and partly remove the other one and make sure they are just sticking well with each other and all that, you have to make sure that the stress in the films is well controlled. Because at the end of the story for a mechanical device it has to be free to move in most cases. And if you have a stress in these films it can just cause a bending of different regions of this material or different this substrate in unwanted ways and uh, that can create problems. You know, it can actually render your device useless. So it is very important to control the internal stress in your films. Also, since at the end of the story this device has to move, sometimes you use sacrificial layers in your fabrication process. So what happens in this case is that, let's say, you deposit the layer of oxide at the bottom of this stack of layers you make your device through lithography and film deposition and all that from the top layers and at the very end of the process you remove this oxide layer and then what that does is that it makes the uh, structure on top of it free to move. You have used an oxide layer but by the end of the process there is no sign of it left and we call that a sacrificial layer. You just use it to create a physical gap at the end of the process between different layers uh, without really having that material left over. Typically we use silicon dioxide in some cases for tourists for our sacrificial layers but you may use other materials uh, in there as well. Actually silicon itself when you deposit it and remove it can be used as a sacrificial layer. With both techniques and especially surface micromachining a challenge is stiction. As you remember, we are depositing these films on top of each other, starting from a wafer that is you know, smooth to the nanometer levels. The next film that you deposit on it, if you do a good job, is going to be smooth again to nanometer levels. All these films are basically mirror-like. And if they come too close to each other, they will stick to each other. And you do not have enough force at these scales to separate them from each other. So you want to make sure that that doesn't happen. You will not have stiction. And uh, the challenge is, you know, how do you do that, for example, if you're doing the wet processes throughout your, your, your sequence, your process sequence, uh, you will have liquid in between these layers. Let's say you remove the sacrificial layer, you have a liquid in there. How do you dry this out without the two structures collapsing on top of each other? Those bring up challenges, and we'll talk briefly about that in, in this lecture and the next lecture. So, what is etching? Well, here is a wafer. The black areas that you see here are, you know, what I have left of the photoresist after my lithography step. And the 
dashed area here is the film that I want to pattern. And then what I usually do is that I go and use a chemical process, sometimes a physical process, to remove that material. The photosis that I have left from my, uh, I have left over from my photolithography step is going to give me uh, access to the film, to the regions of the film that have to be removed, and it protects the rest. So you, you, you call that actually a mask layer, right? Sometimes uh, photoresist is not in terms of uh, chemical stability, is not going to endure the etching step that you have. It, your etching step is too harsh. It is going to remove the film that you want, but it will also remove the photoresist at the same time. And in some cases, in those situations, you deposit a layer that is resistant to the etchant that you want to use and then use that layer to pattern the, uh, the first layer, the initial layer that you wanted to pattern, but photosis could not survive it. So now what happens is that, for example, in the situation, you can look at this graph here. I use photosis to pattern the dashed area, that layer, but then I use that layer to pattern the layer below it. So I go and etch the, photo, the let's say, substrate below it if I want to. You can categorize the etching processes in two two groups, we can call them to be isotropic or anisotropic. A uh, process that is isotropic means that the etch rate proceeds in all directions at the same rate. So I remove material in this direction at the same rate as sideways, right? So that's called an isotropic etching step. Anisotropic, on the other hand, means that you have etch rates at uh, that are direction dependent. So you may go down faster than sideways, for example. Or it could depend on crystal planes, as we will see later on. You can also talk about different chemistries for the etch. It could be wet etching or dry etching. In a wet etching process, you do uh, the etching through, uh, let's say, in a liquid phase. You have chemicals in liquid phase, you put your wafer inside the chemical, uh, inside that chemical bath, and you know, the reactions happen and you remove the wafer at a certain amount of time. Or you can do it in a gas phase, so you basically use these gases, reactants, and particles to remove material from your substrate. We'll talk about dry etching in the next video. So if I want to compare the Profiles that I can get from isotropic versus anisotropic etching. Isotropic is shown on the above. Ideally, in theory, I would expect a circular uh, cross-section for areas that are etched. If my etch rate is truly uh, the same sideways and as well as downwards, so I would like to see, you know, for a small opening, I would probably, in theory, would see a semi-hemisphere. In, in practice, there are other things that will affect it, right? So let's say if the opening is too wide, well, you get more or less a flat bottom, and then on the corners, you may get as much undercut under the mask as you uh, have depth. But there's also loading issues, right? So if the opening is too much, you probably consume too much of the edge and close to the center of the profile and then a little bit less uh, around the edges. There, are, there could be complications that come from the process. But isotropic, at the end of the story, isotropic etchants gives you these curved, nice, let's say, slow changing uh, sidewalls in terms of slope uh, that uh, you may expect in a situation like that. Anisotropic etching, on the other hand, gives you relatively well-defined um, slopes, right? So in this case, uh, the etchant, the anisotropic etchant that we used, let's say etch the 100 plane faster than 111, and you will get these 111 planes that are exposed and 100 keeps going down. But that's a well-defined slope. It's a 111 to 100 uh, angle, right? So <coughs> the process for wet etching is that you first of all need to bring the uh, etchant molecules to the surface of your wafer, the film that has to be removed, let them react with each other over there and remove the byproducts from that location. If the process is diffusion rate limited, it means that the reactants get there more slowly or, or too slowly, right? So what you have is that a bunch of byproducts at the surface, new etchants do not get to the surface of the film to react with it and then basically remove uh, layers 
additional layers of that material. You may have a process that is reaction rate limited. It means that you have new etchant, you have fresh etchant molecules at the surface, but the reaction is not proceeding, right? It's a slow reaction. And there are solutions for both of them. I'd like you to think about the solutions to both problems. If you have a diffusion rate limited uh, etch step or, or a reaction rate limited etch step, what do you do to improve the speed? Just think about it for a second. But the answer is that if it is diffusion rate limited, it's you know whatever that is on the surface that is blocking your etchants to get there. So what you need to do is to remove them. And that's usually done through agitation, to just make sure that you have some flow of material on the surface so you remove the byproduct and bring fresh uh, etchants to the surface. If it is a reaction rate limited process, usually the best you can do, or the first thing you do, is to raise temperature. By raising temperature, you make the reaction proceed a bit faster. So in most situations, we actually do both, right? So you have, uh, when you do a wet etch, you usually have some form of agitation, and in many cases, it is done at elevated temperatures. So here's a table of temp um, some basic etching uh, recipes, wet etching recipes for silicon and silicon dioxide. And uh, you can see, you know, how they are categorized and the properties for these steps. Now, silicon itself can be etched using wet uh, chemistry. Uh, it's, the etchant is called HNA. It's a mixture of nitric acid and hydrofluoric acid. And the solution, the, the idea here is that uh, um, the uh, nitric acid will oxidize silicon and HF will remove silicon dioxide from the surface of the wafer and therefore you start to consume silicon. Uh, you can see that you know from the graph on the right side that you have different parameters to play with with concentrations of um, let's say different concentrations of HF or nitric acid or acetic acid. You can play with the properties. It's not only edge rate that you're changing, usually you also are, uh, are changing the surface roughness. So that becomes a consideration in many cases. You know, how smooth the surface do you want uh, in order to, uh, you know, at a given edge rate. Uh, other um, etchants for silicon are listed here, a few others. These are anisotropic etchants, and especially KOH, which is the most common one. TMAH is also fairly common, but KOH is an anisotropic etchant of silicon. What it does is that it removes the 100 planes at a much higher rate than 111 planes. So when you put the silicon wafer from crystalline silicon into this solution, and you have openings on these, let's say you protect the surface of the silicon with a layer of silicon dioxide, create some openings in that silicon dioxide layer and expose it to KUH, those regions that are along the 100 planes are going to etch much faster than 111 plane. And one theory behind this difference in etch rates is the same two materials at the two sides of the equation. But one theory is that for a 111 plane, each silicon atom that is at the surface, it is held down by three silicon atoms underneath the surface, but for a 100 plane, each silicon atom is held down by two silicon atoms underneath. So in the case of a 111 uh, silicon wafer, that silicon atom is harder to remove. Now, with that in mind, then what happens is that uh, when you put a silicon wafer with some opening, this is the typical profile you get. 111 stays almost where it is, this is a 100 wafer from uh, the direction of the profile at the bottom, you can tell. And 100 keeps going down. And then you can get features like this, right? So you can actually go and have undercut of uh, features. 111 is exposed, 100 keeps going down. And the difference between the edge rates is huge. It's on the order of, let's say, 100 to 1. So for every 100 microns that you go down in depth, you go on the, let's say, one micron normal to the 111 plane. Um, so etching solutions, KOH is the most common one, uh, and the etch rate is quite high on the order of uh, micrometers per minute. Uh, TMAH and EDP are also used. The good thing about TMAH or EDP is that they do not attack uh, 
let's say aluminum or some of the other materials that you commonly have in microelectronics at the expense of that selectivity between 100 and 111 planes. Uh, you can go and look at you know, the edge rate of different planes. Let's say if you have a 100 plane and you want to see what happens to a, uh, let's say, 110 plane in terms of edge rate, you can go and read them off charts like this if necessary. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about uh, this anisotropic wet etching, but what we will see is that you can get, well, well-defined structures, but it creates complexities in terms of possible geometries. So, for example, <coughs> if you have this uh, bit of material left, so let's say it is a, um, let's say a piece of oxide, and I'm etching from around that oxide, the 100 goes down very quickly, 111 is exposed, but at the corner of that oxide layer, when I had these two 111 planes meet, I will have other planes also meet at that edge, at that very edge, right? So those will start to etch. 111 etches very slowly, but those won't. So for example, a 211 plane that is exposed at that edge etches relatively quickly. And then what happens is that the tip of that, at the corner of that, let's say, square that I had and I aligned with 111 plane, I will start to remove material. It creates complexities at the end of the process. It is something that you have to think about if you're making these devices. So if you have a simple profile, let's say a square opening, what happens is that the agent starts to remove the material. You will expose 111 planes. At some point, these 111 planes meet from all four sides and the edge stops or becomes too slow. Uh, if you have more complicated structures like the one shown right there, well, same thing wants to happen, right? So you basically are exposing 111 planes here and everywhere there, else all of these sidewalls are 111 except for this edge. And at that edge, we start to remove the material. So if you wait a little bit longer, you remove some of the material here, wait a bit longer, and you may actually go all the way to the back side of that wafer. So this is the beam that you saw on the previous slide. Now you can actually have an overhanging structure here, right? It's okay if your structures are not too complicated in shape, but if you have some complicated shape on your mask, figuring out what happens to the pattern on the wafer after fabrication is not really that easy and you need to go through some simulations. Nonetheless, this um, anisotropic etching properties gives you, they give you some interesting uh, leverages in terms of uh, uh, what you can do. So for example, here you can see that we have squares that to the naked eye, they are more or less the same size at the top, but at the bottom they have created different openings. And the only reason is that you know, one is maybe one or two microns wider than the other. And at the end of the story, you get holes that are exactly proportional to those differences in, in the squares at the top, at the other side of the wafer, basically. And you can actually go and use this KOH etching, especially KOH, but EDP and TMAH are the same. This property of an isotropic etching in them to your benefit and design some interesting structures. If you want to get that sharp edge at the corner of your let's say square structure, if you don't want it to be undercut, we had to add features to our mask. We have to pre-engineer this so that, you know, for example, in here, we add a little bit of a, a dimple to the corner of the mask. So hopefully this is clear on your slides. And then what it does is that, you know, when you start to etch, you stop the etch at the right time and you get different kinds of profiles depending on how long you keep the edge going, right? So initially, you will have all those corner compensation features here. Later on, you know, some squares are showing as perfect squares, for example, here. Some of them have some of the corner compensation left. And eventually, you know, things change, right? So you start to round up some of them, for example, here, and get perfect squares for some other. So if you time the edge, you can get perfect squares. At the end of the story, this is not trivial. You need to spend a good amount of time and probably a few uh, trial runs to figure out the details. Now, for MEMS devices, when we etch the layers, we want to know how far we have etched. We need to control the depth of the etch process. Uh, 
One thing we know we can do, obvious solution, is that if you know you're removing, let's say, 10 nanometers a minute of that material, and you want to go one micron deep, you wait 100 minutes. You know, that gives you one micron depth. This, in general, is a bad idea because there are several things happen. First of all, the etch rate doesn't depend just on the, let's say, concentration of the uh, etchants in your solution or your substrate material. It depends on a lot of feature, other things like the features that you have on the mask. So let's say, in most cases, openings that are wider etch, etch faster than openings that are narrower. That's easy to understand. Etchants can get in and out more easily if the opening is, too wi is wider. However, if the opening is too wide, then something else happens. Now you have too much material to remove. You may not have enough etchants. You may, your process may become diffusion rate limited, like what we said before. And especially if you're going deep into the substrate, you know, agitation is not going to help you that much. So therefore, you're going to have, let's say, less etch rate at the middle of this structure, faster etch rates at the corners. So by timing the etch, you know, unless you have a very well-defined geometry or, or let's say more or less same openings across the wafer, you're going to have challenges regarding the depth. It's going to be non-uniform. You can use anisotropic etchants. So we saw that, you know, for example, KOH, and if you put a 100 wafer in it, it just etches as far as the two 111 planes meet. Uh, again, not a very good idea. The reason for that is that, you know, in some cases, maybe you don't want to have a sloped sidewall. Maybe you want to have a straight sidewall, right? Or, or other reasons, right? So, again, a possibility, but not really uh, that convenient. And finally, you may etch through the whole film, right? So you deposit a layer of polysilicon, you etch the entire thing. It's, if you know how much you deposited, you know how much you're removing. In terms of depth control, this is the best thing to do. You know the depth because you removed the entire layer. Now, the challenge here is that, okay, how do I know that I've removed all the material? How do I stop once I'm done with the entire, uh, let's say, layer, once I've gone through that entire film? And normally what you need to do is that you need to have this tank of materials where you have one chemistry to etch this material, but the material underneath requires a different chemistry. So the chemistry that removes the layer on top will stop automatically once it hits the bottom layer. And this is one application of SOI wafers that we mentioned before. We mentioned that there are these silicon on insulator wafers where you have a layer of silicon on top of a buried oxide layer. And we mentioned that they make the life of a process designer much easier. This is why. Because I can go and etch through the entire layer of that top silicon uh, layer, stop on buried oxide, make sure I have more or less the same thickness of the film everywhere on the wafer, and go and proceed do, and do the next uh, step. So here is a sequence for a simple process, right? So you have an SY wafer, you put your metal down, you cut through the entire silicon wafer, stopping on the oxide. And then if you want to make a moving structure, you can remove some of that oxide through a subsequent etching step. So that's that for wet etching. We are going to talk about an alternative to wet etching. We call it dry etching, where we do all the uh, chemical processes in a gas phase instead of a liquid phase, and we'll see what the differences and advantages are.